mean, we've talked a lot about trial and error. We've talked a lot about learning lessons from data. Uh, I think one of the things that also gets missed is whenever you, you start looking for a new platform or you start working on new tools, the actual process itself, I think, changes you. And, and so I wanted to explore that a little bit. So um, what I'll do is I'll let the guys introduce themselves. Um, so Andy, do you want to say who you are and what you do? Um, good afternoon to everybody. Um, yeah, so my name's Andy Bramall. I've been working in games technology for over 15 years. Um, I was the last seven of which I was at Unity working with this wonderful man. Um, and so I've just, just started working with a new company, Spirit AI. So I've seen lots of things. Lots of lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> Emma, tell me about yourself. So yeah, hi, I'm Emma and I'm from Do Dreams. I'm a game artist and uh, lately I've been working with AR mostly, so we've been prototyping on AR. So been working with some interesting stuff over there, so could share some interesting. And what we're kind of hoping for this is because we've kind of, kind, of, kind of almost got diametric opposites, you know, we, the old uh, laggard, that's talking about myself here, <laughs> and then we've got Andy, yeah. uh, and then on the, yeah. uh, and you're relatively, kind of relatively fresh to kind of the, yeah. the game space. So I think this is what I think is kind of key to it. So, I mean, let's talk a bit about technologies you've specifically been working with right now. So, no, Andy, you're working with kind of this character AI kind of stuff. Do you want to sort of talk about what that does? Yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, say so Spirit AI is a, is a startup company. We've been running for about sort of two years or so, um, and we have two products that we're working on, which are specifically built on, um, uh, you know, sort of. Uh, dynamic language um, processing. So you can look at um, we have one, one is a product called uh, Character Engine, which allows you to do um, procedurally generated dialogue for non-player characters um, and so that you can uh, instead of having sort of pre-scripted conversations you would have with, with NPCs in your game, um, you can define pieces of information that the, character, you know, the, the NPC is aware of and also their interactions with the player themselves and then um, they can and generate their own uh, responses dynamically. So if they like the character, that then they can give them more information. Or if they dislike them, then they can either with withhold information or just straight lie to them, which is quite fun. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's a way in which you can get much more engagement with your characters. Um, we also have some other technology called Ally, which is to deal with um, moderation of online games. So uh, either sort of in-game chat or um, going on forums and, and so on. So both identifying either negative behavior from characters for players, or encouraging sort of positive behaviour and giving that information back to community managers. And I think what I find interesting about that is both of those have different use cases, but what they're asking you as a developer and a designer to do mm -hmm. is change your preconceptions about the way the Absolutely. interactions work. And I think that lens, that sort of mindset change is mm -hmm. an important kind of lesson for people to sort of get their heads around. I mean, yeah. have you seen how... Is it take, how, how do people generally address that process? Um, I think obviously that we, you know, particularly like with, with the character engine side of things, that people have to understand um, uh, the way in which that they can construct that information and almost, if you like, experiment with, with some aspects of the design. But it also means that you need to get that in, integrated sort of very early in the process and such. So, um, you know, it, it's naturally sort of, you know, targeted at either, um, uh, you know, uh, narrative storytelling or, or, uh, or, or again sort of RPGs, that sort of type of activity. But it, it does mean that you have to, it gives you a lot of flexibility about how you can, um, you know, deliver the story that you want to, to, and the experiences you want to the player, but in a very sort of constructive way. Yeah. So let's sort of expand that into sort of the kind of VR and AR kind of thing. So we're talking about in, in VR and AR, it's still relatively new, but it is a different paradigm in terms of how you operate, that sense of immersion, particularly with VR, and that sense of sort of presence in space that mm. AR gives you, how does that change the way you think as a developer, as a designer? Uh, well, first of all, I think, um, um, well, I've been working on uh, some um, different technologies, like um, there's been Tango from Google, for example, and um, the tags uh, things that were before ARKit, so you basically have to have something on the floor all the time, like a uh, tag where you spawn stuff. So um, um, I, th I think there, there's just um, interesting stuff you can do with um, with like controls and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Since, um, for example, uh, we've been working on a golf application or golf game now. It's a mini golf, uh, so you're basically using uh, the um, 
uh, device as the controller. So you swing the device itself and not uh, actually have like this basic, um, you know, twin stick or something like that controllers on on the on the screen itself. So I think there's a lot of interesting ways you can use like controls. And I really like that kind of idea that you're you're kind of getting the opportunity because of the way that tech is working yeah. to step back from the expectation of how we use these. In some ways, it's a bit like kind of when we did the move controller in the first place, it kind of got our heads thinking about what could be done differently. <laughs> but now we're doing something even more deeper into the world around us. And even when it was the sort of markers on the, on the ground or on the side, you're still having this kind of idea of the fixed position in space that's in the real world. And does that, do you think it has a sort of effect on the way that you kind of approach projects? Is there more freedom because you've got this? Or does it introduce different constraints? Well, um, we've had these like restrictions from, for example, like we want to create uh, create something on our brand. Like we have this brand from uh, before, so we have a successful game called Drive Ahead, and we want to create something um, that is basically on terms of that, um, like it, it fits to the to the brand. So. Um, 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 Sorry, I lost That's right. my thought there. Um, I'm, I'm being very unfair because I'm, I'm forgetting the order of questions I said I'd set. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, I think that's really, for me, the kind of area that I, I find fascinating about any adoption of new technology, because one of the things that uh, I think most challenging in many ways is that we have markets like mobile and, and even Steam where it, it gets very constrained and there's lots of competition and you okay, we'll think, okay, we'll go to the next platform, we'll go to the next tool, we'll find the next technology that will save us. But I think my interest is, is the stuff that you're talking about, which is not the, oh, that will save us. It's, instead, it's a, look what this now offers. This, look, what could we do? What's the possibility? And it sounds like what you were saying earlier. It's like saying, this is a really important thing, is the chance to think about the possibility. Right, right. So you have to kind of think about the creativity and, uh, and how you could, because there is not much out there yet. Like the AR is pretty new in that sense, that there's uh, not too many games that use the, um, the AR uh, in, in a good way. You, you just have, um, like a, you use the camera and look around and there's something spawning and you just mm -hmm. tap on them. So that's not really, I don't, I don't think that's really using the full capability of AR. So I think you should actually like think further and kind of use the creativity because there is a lot of creati creativity in this industry. So I think it is it's not shown its full potential just yet. Well, I think if you like, um, th th there's several examples, I think, where you've had new hardware platforms that have been introduced. Some people have used, made good use of either if they've got you know, new controllers or new ways in which you can interact with things. Um, in other cases, it's not worked very well because they've either not understood that or just basically taken you know, any sort of existing game and not make use of specifically of the new features that's introduced with the platform. I think, you know, um, sort of VR is a really sort of good example of that, was that, you know, some, some, some of the, you know, the early titles on, 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 on released on VR have been really, you know, extraordinary experiences. In other cases, that they've not taken into account the design aspects about, you know, the limitations of the hardware or motion sickness and that type of thing, which had terrible experiences for people playing the game. So, um, well, I'm intrigued in terms of, so you're saying that you use the device actually like as a, as a golf club in that. In yeah, that yeah. So, how, how do you get over, um, like, seeing how you strike the ball. I mean, it's good, obviously, if you've got a tablet and you start, you know... Well, we, we've got the, con uh, the, the club on the, on the screen, actually. So okay. you have this button where you toggle it on and off. So whenever you're moving around, and so you, you wouldn't hit the ball accidentally. Oh, okay. So we just activate it, and then you can swing, and then, well, then you cool. hit the ball, yeah. But I think, that's, to me, that's, that's great, because one of the things, that, like you said earlier, the early experiments yeah. are often a mix of yes. the crazy... Yeah. Or the benign, you know, banal. Sorry, the, the, <laughs> the banal. By, by which I mean banal is like how many? How many of you have seen kind of like someone's just tried to do like a Space Invaders or something in a in a VR? It's just mm -hmm. tedious and pointless. There's no actual value in having yeah. that game in that context. And all the developers trying to do is just to could they make it? Yes, could them get it out? But actually, it's not something that demonstrates what the capacity of that platform is about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for, you know, even in terms of things like using you, you know, AI to do things inside a game, I think right. 
Are you seeing the same sort of thing, this kind of difference between the genius and the banal? Uh, yes, I think so. I think, um, you know, VR was a very sort of an easy example for that, because I think um, I remember seeing um, uh, one game, which again, I, I, I won't mention what it is, but um, uh, they demonstrated the game like it developed um, in, in, in Brighton, and uh, the um, head of quite a major studio in the UK played this game and had such violent motion sickness that he actually he fell over on the train on the way home. I, I, <laughs> I know the game. <laughs> um, and yet there's other examples like um, like the, one of my favourite examples for that would be uh, like Land's End um, from, from from us two uh, on Gear VR. Did anyone play uh, Land's End from us two? Yeah. I mean, I did. It's, Look, yeah, it's, good. it's 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 an incredible game because it, it's it, it gets over the sort of the issues about um, uh, motion sickness and navigating around inside the world. It's because it's a very simple sort of teleportation game. Um, but it also gives you, because it makes use of, of you know, proper use of, of a VR headset and also just simple interactions, that you can actually um, really get a very positive experience from playing the game. I remember. Um, uh, demonstrating the game to a collection of um, uh, investment bankers here in Helsinki, and it is incredible that they are like women with like power clothes on and, and high heels and everything else like that. And um, she started playing the game. And one of the first things that you do is that you walk out on the top of a cliff and you can look down and you can see all these sort of seagulls and everything so it's locally around. And she literally she was like reaching out to hold on to something because she she was feeling like almost like vertigo. She was looking down at all these things and had a very sort of strong impression upon her. Um, and so it, it's, you know, that's a... Um, the design was, was implemented in such a way that it really made great use of the, of, of the hardware and actually made the whole experience much better. Yeah, and I, and I talked to the guy that did that at yeah. us too, and he was, he was saying that it was, they were looking at it more as a, a... just seeing what could they do in that space. Yes. Uh, that strikes me a lot of the stuff that we've been hearing this afternoon is the same principle. It's like, okay, well, we've got these tools, what yeah. could we do with them? Yeah. And I think that attitude, rather than the, oh, let's just chuck something that already exists, mm -hmm. is much more effective. So, I mean, does that sound like kind of what you do or what you try to do? Yeah, we, we're trying to, of course, like create, create something new that hasn't been there yet, mm -hmm. since, well, there's not much to look at yet because it's, it's so new. Uh, so we've tried a couple of prototypes, like for example with the Tango uh, technology, we tried to create um, a flying game uh, called Fly Ahead. <laughs> uh, what a surprise. <laughs> So yeah, you you uh, it would recognize the walls and create collision. So you would have a room where you could fly around and shoot down stuff. But we found out that uh, well, it's not that easy to fly around um, when you're looking at the plane flying around over there in the in the room, mm -hmm. and you would still fly it as you you would fly be flying a first person uh, plane. So. Yeah, yeah, I was. Um, um, there's a team that do. Uh, like a, they're out in the uh, demo area doing a VR experience with a truck, and we had loads of conversations about how do you control the truck? Because if you look ahead of the truck to kind of determine speed or direction, then you're not looking at the truck. So, but if you're looking at the truck, you're kind of trying to follow it, and so you end up with this. Especially if you're trying to do some of the earlier stuff, you know, like cardboard type games, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thinking about control system schemes that work yeah. in that limited context, when you, they just don't map with the old ways of working. Because I can't see my hands, I can't do anything with my hands, so I've mm -hmm. got to find some other clever way to operate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no. But I mean, have you, what other sort of things like that do you think you, you've picked up? Because I think these are these little kind of Tidbits that you pick up. These like um, I saw what it is. Is I mean, maybe, maybe the reason why I get to sit, stand on stage a lot is because because I started doing mobile stuff before there was any really. I got to sort of learn those little lessons that only comes from being there early. Only comes from kind of testing out what was possible because we don't have the preconceptions. You don't have the you know the previous models to copy. Do you find that you're discovering? Paradigms, discovering rules that people should be learning about. Um, well, I think you just think kind of need to think outside the box. So, like, since there isn't that much out there yet, so. Um, 
Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's fine, that's fine. I mean, it's a tough one because, like I say, it's often hard to put in words the, the, the stuff that we discover. But, I mean, you, you, I mean, you've just seen similar things in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, what sort of things do you think, what do you think is the biggest challenge, really, when you're looking, when you're addressing a new platform that, you, that um, people aren't on you? What, from, from a technical perspective or, well, or from a design perspective? I think from a design perspective, okay. initially, anyway. I, th I think, again, yeah. it's, 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 it's not doing the obvious, is the mm. way I would look at it, in that, that if you have, um, uh, you know, there's, you know, again, you have to sort of try and understand it, if you're like either, you know, how the control system would work in that situation or, or um, you know, any sort of, you know, feature-specific aspects of, of the technology, how you can get that into a point which is going to be sufficiently engrossing for it to be like the heart of your game as such. And so, um, uh, you know, it, it's... One of the things I think that's interesting about the difference with like, the AR applications, for example, is that you, you don't have the sort of the standard problem about there's not enough hardware out there that can run these, these things in the first place. Whereas obviously right. you know, these are all mobile devices that there's not you know billions of them out there already. Right. So from a, um, a commercial perspective, if your game is going to be successful, then you've got a huge target market you could work with. You know, whereas the, if if you're looking normally at a, like a console or, or um, again like a, a VR headset, one of the limitations that you've got is there aren't that many of them out there. Uh, no, no. I mean PSVR. How many? I mean uh, uh, yes. Okay. Okay. I mean, I, I have one. It's great. I spend yeah. money on it, I and mean, proper money on on games for it. Yes. Uh, and I enjoy it. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't pick it up every day. No, I, 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 it's again. I think it's a case that you. Um, that's why you, if your gameplay experience is, is sufficiently engrossing, that it is something that you could look to play, you know, every day. I think that. Um, um, <coughs> yeah. No. No. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, again, this this comes back to the sort of the same kind of idea. It's as why. You know, obviously you're doing a lot of stuff with AR, but AR is a shifting beast, as we know. You know, it's gone from these markers to now looking at things like AR Kit and, and right. Tango. Um, how big a transition for you was it to go from those sort of markers to thinking about those sort of markerless kind of experiences? Did that change the way you worked? Um, a little bit, yeah, because there's no, so there's so much more um, space and more um, possibility in there when you actually can put stuff anywhere and like who's actually going to print out those tags? Like <laughs> we we can't we can't really like ex expect people to like print out things like that. So there's uh, so much more. Um, I think we can reach so much more more people with the uh, with ARKit version of 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 things. And what I, what I want to add to the tech, tech and the availability to um, uh, to the devices is that it was kind of funny. Like Tango is so so great as a technology; it can like mm -hmm. uh, track motion, and and you can really well count all the all the bumps and everything on the on like real life surface. But it's only on two devices at the moment. Like, <laughs> who's actually gonna yeah, yeah. <laughs> gonna play your game when you only have it on two devices? So. <laughs> There's not a big market. It's like the, the problem with the kind of uh, the head-mounted to PC devices. The scale isn't there. Mm -hmm. um, right. But that doesn't mean we don't think this is the way forward. I mean, at the end of the day, I think you know, JL Unity talks about this as, you know, we're looking at this as a long-term kind of experience. Yeah. And, yeah. and obviously, we're talking a lot about VR and AR here, and there's a wider set of technologies. Uh, what's in my mind is this... this Moving, it's this rolling future. Whatever the platform is, whether it's from the mm -hmm. AR po AI point of view or the the visual display point of view, or whether it's from other some other other kind of technology in terms of background infrastructure, whatever it might be. If you're living on this bleeding edge of possibilities, it's a painful, damaging process. Oh, yeah. how, how do you cope with it, and how do you deal with it? Um, I think you have to have very smart people uh, is, is the key to that, and also an ability to um, deal with, with, with moving goalposts is the way I would look at it. I always, always remember a um, uh, couple of things that we do, like going back to... Um, back to the PSP when that was released as such that, that uh, everybody had a sort of an expectation about what it was going to be in literally about a month before the thing shipped. They cut the clock speed by 25% to save the battery life and so everybody's, everybody's performance figures went out the window. <laughs> um, and uh, so that, that ability to, to, to deal with, with, you know, something which, which is going to be evolving over a period of time is, is quite a difficult thing to deal with. Um, but I do feel that 
both hardware manufacturers understand that better in terms of getting better, better tooling that goes with it and, to, and, and, and profilers and that type of thing. And also that, you know, with sort of third party engines like Unity and other people um, are very good at, you know, helping overcome those sort of technical issues because in, mo in many cases that they are available you know either at the point of release of the, of, of the platform or very soon after that so, so you look at things like you know with Nintendo uh, with the Switch I think nearly half the, the release titles that were out there were all Unity authored mm. um, yeah. so I think it gives you a chance to, to get access to these things early on so I mean again it, so do you find that experience yourself so you talked about only two Tango devices are you do you get access to them do you, you do you have the relationships with the do you have to have a lot of relationships with the people who are making those platforms those devices those technologies great well if you're early like out there and you start doing stuff like for example AR kit since they uh, since Apple kind of said they would be doing this we already had been kind of talking with them earlier and of course they couldn't mm -hmm. like say anything like okay we're gonna do AR next year uh, so we kind of already had that idea that okay they might be doing AR and we had that hunch so um, when they uh, said they would be uh, releasing AR kit later, we already started doing stuff like, okay, what what could we do uh, in terms of mm -hmm. of AR? And they actually, it, it was like for a small company, it's really valuable that you do that because then they will notice you and you have so much more um, possibilities to kind of send them your stuff and show what you're doing, and they're actually interested, and that's really valuable, I think. And that kind of support that you'll get if you show commitment. But again, I think to this, mm -hmm. this point about there's a lot of pain on that process, it sounds like you kind of got to hope that the, the, the providers of the supporting technology, whether it's a Unity or, mm -hmm. or other, other engines, do exist. Um, so whatever that provider is, it's got to hopefully knock the corners off the sharp edges um, to make it a little easier for you to get there fi fast enough. But is there a... Comp is there a, is there a balance between trying things out and, and waiting for the tech to catch up? I, th I think in some cases it, it's, it does give you some really great opportunities if you're able to have, to have that type of relationship with the, you know, it can give you exposure at a much higher level than you would expect. I was thinking of um, like the team that made um, fantastic contraption on, um, yeah. on Vive. Yeah. You know, two person, you know, husband and wife team in that case, and they, they were right on the edge financially, but had this idea for the game they wanted to put together, and they did that, and that's, you know, both in terms of, you know, investment from, uh, you know, from, from HTC Vive, and also, um, you know, from a, from a commercial perspective, it's one of the best-selling titles on the platform, Absolutely. and that saved them. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, we, it, so we, what, we're, what we're saying is that this might come with risk, but it comes with a couple of really kind of powerful opportunities. One is, you're the first to market, which yeah. helps, but equally, you're presumably the first to know what works and what doesn't work as well. Um, yes, I think so. I think it, it's, it's um, uh, you know, does, does give you an opportunity to do that. But, but again, come back to um, the, the whole, some of the potential hardware issues, it, it, it does, you know, it does give you an idea to, to sort of experiment with things from a design perspective. But sometimes, again, if, if, if you can also talk, turn up other issues. There was a... Um, one of the sort of Oculus projects that I was involved in when I was at, uh, at Unity was um, uh, um, <clears throat> was was was, a, was was being developed by the guys at Aardman, um, oh, yeah, yeah. and uh, they had uh, it was a VR experience about what it was like to be um, one of the refugees uh, escaping from Syria, trying to get over in, into Greece, um, and uh, there was a title called We Wait. And literally, it was a case that they had a, a very strict release date that was tied up with the BBC they were working with. And they developed all this on, on um, DK2 um, hardware kits. And they were looking to try and ship it on, um, on the, when they were releasing the, um, uh, the commercial headsets. Um, and they didn't have one. <laughs> to test it on. So I lent them one of us that we have from our demo system and all the gamma on the, on the displays was off. So they had to redo all their lighting literally 24 hours before they shipped the game. Ouch. Uh, that, that redefined crunch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, have you had that kind of experience? As, you know, or it, you, you've had it a little bit, I don't know, hopefully easier than that? Uh, well, um, for the mini golf game I talked to you about, we had two months to develop it in the beginning. And um, at some point, we got some um, new ideas that, yeah, we should change the game completely, kind of 
Uh, so the feature group. <laughs> yeah, let's add this feature of. That's yeah. never happened. No, ever. no, no. It's like you can expect uh, the thing to change all the time. So, so we ended up changing the art style quite a bit in like. Uh, Quite late in the development, so as an artist, I think that's really like it's really stressful. But if you really believe in something, you want to put it out there. You actually do it, and then you just learn to cope with the stress. <laughs> was, was, was that sort of challenge? Change was that based on on performance then, or was it just trying to to get images that that would be clear to use, you know, in the game in terms of the. the why, why was it that you decided to change the art style? Well, we, we first of all, like the the game itself, we kind of thought about it to be like a casual game for kind of everyone, kind of like Wii Sports style, so we could mm -hmm. get more people into it and stuff. Yeah. So um, at some point, we real realized we wanted to bring it more towards the brand of Drive Ahead. So then we change it to Drive Ahead Mini Golf. So that that kind of uh, was ne it was necessary to bring like Drive Ahead elements to that. Okay. In, in that point, so we needed more assets, uh, like uh, obstacles for for mini golf courses and and like f other fun stuff that could be in there that <laughs> made it more like cars and drive ahead. <laughs> well, and, and, and the particular art style that you had, I'm assuming, so that presumably added different constraints. Did it have any direct impact though on gameplay when you had to make that choice? You know, because you know. You might be just, are you just reskinning at that stage, or does the fact that you're using an AR game change the way you look at how you do that? Well, it was kind of like more like a reskin rather than changing the gameplay at that point. Um, There's enough going on, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we added like mines and stuff that actually affect your gameplay, but <laughs> that's this <laughs> probably. That's small. what I was thinking of, though. Is that I, I, I kind of expected you to have something like that. Yeah, some like explosions. explosions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so let's, let's, we talked a lot about AR, obviously, we'll carry on, I'm sure, but I mean, let's, let's talk a little bit about kind of like the use of the AI side of things, because, you know, I'm, I'm particularly fascinated by that, because I think when you start looking at the combination of particularly VR and, and AI, when you start mm -hmm. having more natural conversations yeah. with NPCs, what does that do for storytelling? Quite a bit. Yeah, <laughs> it's, well, I, I think it's, it's a case that... Um, there's, there's, there's enormous potential for, for looking at that and also just trying to make the, the entire experience much more of a, a believable one. Um, I, th I think there's, there's quite a lot of underlying technology that, we, again, we need to make sure is going to be into place. So things like, you know, um, speech to text in terms of being able to, you know, how you, how you would control and how you would um, generate dialogue with, 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 with characters is quite interesting. But also how you can change um, the response of, of of, of the characters in the game, depending on you know sort of gestures and, and how how close you know if you're if you're moving you know very close to somebody that has a different sort of psychological effect on that as, as 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 characters as such and so that's some of the things that we're starting to look at I think um, it it's. It's still very early days, though, I think. Yeah, and it's that. a rolling feast as well, I imagine. Yeah. At some point, we're going to have, like, uh, are we going to use the webcam to be able to see someone's face? Are we going to start having, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, goggles which are, like, look at our, the way that we, where we're looking and, right. and whether we're smiling or not and, and using those kind of pieces. I remember when, we were, uh, when I was at Sony and they were doing the original testing for Until Dawn, which was originally going to be a move controller game. Right. They did a whole bunch of tests where they watched people's reaction. Every time uh, they had a certain look on their face, you know, when they were frightened, they did something worse in the game. <laughs> and it was hilarious. And you, uh, watching these moments of people's fear mm. and then having the game respond to it and then doubling back on it was brilliant. It was just amazing. And when you start seeing those kind of experiments happening and the possibilities that that unlocks, if I can tie it in and the game knows how to respond because I've given it a set of mm -hmm. instructions and it knows within this framework to do these behaviours, Right. that sounds to me like a, a narrative writer's dream. <laughs> I, 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 I do think there's, there's, there is there is this great potential there. I think the the other side to that though is that the, one of the challenges from from again going back to from a design perspective and from yeah. a narrative perspective is to make sure that you you know it, it, that you will still construct it in such a way that you still end up having a coherent story, but also that that it, it does what you would expect 
you know, yeah. uh, the, the, the behaviours in, in, in the game to be as well. So, um, so you, you, you still want to get over those, over those messages and such, but it's, it, you have to be very careful about how you define the environments that you're working in. And, and in particular, I mean, I'm, I love branching narrative, mm -hmm. but there's some writers that just can't adapt to it. And it's, right. it's, I think it's one of the interesting challenges to see how many writers are able to do the kind of stories that can, uh, can use those kind yeah. of you know, those tools. But, but even you could do that with, with, with um, relatively simple games as well. I mean, the one, one of the games that I always really sort of like, and fr from that perspective, from a, um, a, a narrative perspective, is 80 Days. Mm. If you, it was oh, the, I love that that's, It's a beautiful game, but also a very simple game. But you have, you know, you can get quite detailed information about the relationships between the characters and different storylines every time that you play it. But that's still based on a sort of a branch narrative approach. In terms of but it's that. an interesting branch narrative because yes. it's not entirely branching. Your branching is where, which route you should take as much as I ever but yeah. there are choices in each one, but they don't always have a dr dramatic effect on the story. Yes. It's almost like it's a location incident story, yes. arguably. And I, I love that, a different way of writing. You know. mm -hmm. And uh, to me, this is sort of like, what if I behave in a space, and the, not just the character responds right. to me, but the events in the world respond to me, mm -hmm. that fascinates me. In fact, that literally has fascinated me for 30 years. <laughs> My very first pitch as a game developer right. when I was 18 uh, was proposing a game that would actually change the, you know, the behaviour of the environment every time you had interacted with somebody. It's bizarre. I'd forgotten about it until I saw my, my best man the other day. He <laughs> reminded me. And it's this, this is something I think has been the dream for lots of people for mm -hmm. a long, long time. Are we there yet, or are we just at another milestone to get uh, I, 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 th I think we are starting to, to approach the point where we can have that sort of type of, type of things. Um, so I, I actually gave a talk about this um, last week, <laughs> uh, where um, I was, was talking about sort of again like the, the relationships with characters that you can have and how that can change. And, and so, you know, I, I had several games that I, I like real favourites of mine. So, um, like with like, you know, Red Dead Redemption, like I'm a huge, I have a huge man crush on, yeah, on yeah. John Malston. And I always wanted to ask him, like, you know, where did he get his scar from and, and, um, and all that type of thing. And again, it's a beautiful, really complex, detailed character, but you can't have a conversation with him. Mm. It's all dealt with through, through um, cut, script, you know, cut scenes and, and um, scripted interactions. But it, I always felt that even though he was a character I've, I've really invested a lot of time in, mm. there were so many things I would like to have asked so him. So much well. you didn't know about him. Yes, yeah, exactly. yes, exactly. So I think you know, similarly in terms of, sort of the VRA journey, I mean, well, I think we've all accepted that we're not at the end goal yet, but do we think we're getting to a point where, particularly with AR, we've got a feasible platform you know, do we think we're going to see something this year that's going to get scale that means that more than just the innovators will start developing in that space? Well, yeah, I think there's a huge possibility with AR since we're getting more and more these high-end devices uh, that people can play with and then Obviously, uh, we can hope for another kind of V V sports kind of thing, mm -hmm. where mm. like people who don't consider themselves as gamers kind of like start playing and think it's like hey, this is cool, it's like a hobby mm. you could do, like play on your. <laughs> AR. Wait, it makes me wonder. I mean, do, do we think Pokemon Go, even though technically you probably could argue it's not really an AR game, but did you think that changed people's? consciousness about what AR was and how acceptable that was as an idea? Do you think it had an effect? Sorry, what? The Pokemon Go. Oh, Pokemon Go. Do you think um, it had an effect? Because my feeling is it did, but I'd love to know what you think. I, I think it brought awareness to like what AR is, but like personally, the, I, I think the, the use of the camera in the game isn't really necessary and people don't okay. really use it either. So the only thing that is AR is basically the map that is like projected on real world. And that's a location game to be yeah. frank, isn't it? So yeah. You guys no. No, no. <laughs> I mean, well, I was going to go a bit further than that because I think, you know, with, with that, uh, what I would say though is I think as, the, as part of the kind of media consciousness, they've become aware of the idea of AR being images on over the real world. And I think largely, you know, major effects through Pokemon. But what I want to worry about is when we start changing the terms all the time. So VR is something, AR is something, uh, XR is something, MR is something. What? Yeah. Are, we, are we our own worst enemies, do you think? I don't think so. No. <laughs> what, inventing acronyms for our stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, 
God, no, the games, we would fall to, fall to its knees if you couldn't make up new names. That's true. We have to have more acronyms. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. More XTLAs. Exactly. Yeah. So. <laughs> but I, I think, I do actually worry, because I think we've just managed to get, you know, people like, you know, the, the mainstream press to understand AR is a thing, and we're already moving on. Um, and I, I, you know, with AR Kit coming out, and with the Google equivalent, AR Core, is AR it? Core, yeah, yeah. yeah. I always forget. Um, those things, those technologies are basically here now. I mean, all, you know, more, more or less here. And in the devices people have already got. And I, that to me feel, I smell this is like a, a not, not a boom period, but an opportunity to really establish what AR gaming could look like. Do you feel the same way? Yeah, yeah. And I think like if you think about people already using AR, like Snapchat and those kind of applications where you... Um, Basically, you can f track your face and add, add stuff on, on it so, and change your voice, for example, if you're sending funny videos to your friends. I think that that's like young people who are using that, that, uh, that kind of technology or applications, they already know kind of the base of, yeah. of how it works. So I think it's interesting if we can translate that to games somehow, that we can bring those people who already know that stuff kind of to gaming. And again, it's what interesting because I I've seen lots of people talking about doing games. I mean, my favourite one with the AR kit I've seen so far, and it's not that clever, but it's it really was impressive to watch. Was basically a, a, a tower block building game, and you built the tower block up, but the tower block was on that table, and as mm -hmm. I moved the phone round. And the nicest thing was moving my phone into the tower block, so I could see the little coffee shop I set up, and they were serving coffee inside my cool. tower block. Yeah. That was awesome. <laughs> And yet, you know, a lot of the AR stuff is, you know, um, is when you're watching people walk, running around the world, there's an object in the world coming at you and you're shooting it or you're doing whatever else. But I wonder if this, like, like you said, the video selfie, is, is, that a, is there a game in there as well? I don't know. I don't know. There could be a game in there. Can hmm? you gamificate it? I don't know. Yeah, gamify. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't use that word. So, any, I mean, has anyone got any other any questions for us? So I can happily carry on talking. But if you have any questions, then please shout. I'll come over and get you involved. But I mean, what I'm really trying to get to at this is, I and mean, probably best to sort of uh, think about it this way is, what is the real lesson we're we're talking about here? Is it what what we, do we when it comes to a adopting new technology, whether it's AI or VR or AR or XR or whatever, new console, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. what's the thing, the lesson you think people should take away as how to deal with adopting a rolling feast like that? I think it's a case that they have to be flexible in terms of the way that we obviously have a, have a good idea in terms of understanding, you know, something which is the, the specifics of where, what the new technology is, is, is offering you in terms of, as from a design perspective. Um, but also, you know, once you start to investigate and work with it over a period of time and be aware of its limitations and its potential, not being sort of too, um, uh, too precious with your ideas. So, you, you know, being prepared to change things, you know, either to accommodate, you know, the hardware or performance issues or just whether it's fun to play is, is, is the key thing, really. Yeah, I agree completely. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think the main thing is just to keep doing, like, prototype, 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 see what works and yeah. what doesn't, and kill, kill them early enough, so... Certainly. If I mean, for me, there's like two kind of ways of doing it. I mean, and I think they, they kind of need to happen in parallel, which is, what can you do with what you've got now? I think something that we don't do enough of. What, what interesting things can we do with the tech that we know works? But then, knowing what might be coming, how can we push that to do something, something that no one else is doing yet? And finding the balance between kind of being able to sort of focus on what's possible right now that will just work and what you can then move on to. That balancing act, I think, is always the tension for me. And I think if you can pull that off, that's when you, you get the kind of really delicious, interesting gameplay experiences. Because at the end of the day, like you said, mm -hmm. gameplay comes first. Yeah, absolutely. Because if it's dull, people won't buy it. <laughs> and on that note... Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> thanks. Thank you. So thanks for that. Uh, hopefully you got uh, something out of that week. Oh, thank you. <laughs>